Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for joining us. Throughout this year, as part of the university's Love Thee Notre Dame initiative, we are sharing stories of Notre Dame alumni, parents, and friends who, through estate gifts and other types of planned gifts, enliven Notre Dame's sacred mission in incredible ways. Now, more than ever, given the pandemic, the economic volatility of the past several months, and the uncertainty of the road ahead, these gifts inspire hope and confidence in the university's ability to be a force for good in the world both now and for generations to come. I am absolutely thrilled today to be joined by my dear friend and very special guest, Ken Rickey. In 2017, Ken and his wife Pamela made history when they announced an unprecedented, first of its kind, $100 million estate commitment to the university, the largest unrestricted gift ever made to Notre Dame, and we believe in the history of higher education. The incredible scope and impact of this gift is matched only by the uncommon thoughtfulness and wisdom with which Ken and Pamela approach the topics of estate planning and planned giving, topics that for most of us can seem otherwise complicated. Ken is a proud Notre Dame alumnus and a parent, a 40-year aviation industry veteran, and principal at Directional Aviation Capital, which owns various aviation enterprises that operate more than 150 aircraft and employ over 2,000 individuals. Ken's business accolades are numerous. Among them, he has been named Ernst & Young's Entrepreneur of the Year, and in 2016, received the Lifetime Aviation Entrepreneur Award from the Living Legends of Aviation. Ken is the author of Management by Trust, a book featuring practical management techniques for building employee trust and success. And his management strategies have been featured in multiple publications, including the Wall Street Journal. At Notre Dame, Ken is an executive member of the Board of Trustees, the Kavanaugh Council, and Notre Dame's Gift Planning Advancement Committee. Among all the ways Ken and Pamela have served Notre Dame, two of their more visible gifts have been the Ricky Band Building, named after his father, and the Ricky Family Fields, both wonderful gifts supporting the Notre Dame student body, and in particular, the Band of the Fighting Irish. Ken, thanks so much for being with us today. It's a great pleasure to be in your company, once again, in this case, virtually. As always, uh, you upstage me. You're always dressed to the nines, uh, looking your finest. Um, I know that uh, these recent times have been tough, but you are one of the most upbeat personalities that I know. So give us a little background on how you, Pamela, and the kids are managing uh, the current day crisis. Well, uh, first of all, Lou, it's uh, great to be here, and I always enjoy doing things for Notre Dame. Uh, let me start by saying something you and I, both Italian, will understand, uh, molto gentile, which means in Italian, you were too kind in your introduction, but, 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 but thank you very much. Um, you know, what I like about what you're doing, and I know you do a lot of these, is that this creates a community. Uh, these events, these, and, and you, it's hard to create community during the pandemic. And I think uh, we're so used to having events where we're all together, be they religious mass, where you know we're together at mass, we're together. And we, a congregation is what mm -hmm. we do, and so I think one of the challenges, you know, for our family, for our companies, for Notre Dame, is really just finding a way to have community. And so uh, I'll also <coughs> tell you before we really get into this that you're, we're in, we're in my office today. This is our operational center where we can control many of the aircraft uh, through, through FlexJet. I've also taken the opportunity to include some of our key leadership team that's also in the room, socially distanced from me here, mm -hmm. so that we can try to find an event within our company to make a community. And uh, I, I also don't ever mind exposing them all to Notre Dame. 
Uh, Family-wise, it's been uh, is interesting. I, you know, what I what I tell my family is the one thing that'll happen is coming out of this pandemic, we're all going to come out with rich and unique stories, and so find those opportunities to create the rich and unique stories. I um, I run an Instagram page where I focus on travel, mm -hmm. and I've been to so many. I have so many different travel experiences, and I and I've. Quite frankly, just traveling is really important. Uh, but traveling's been really difficult right now. So what I notice on the Instagram page is you can learn a lot more about cooking pasta than you can about the best places to stay, stay in Italy. Um, but we've tried to find things within the family for each person to do. Uh, I originally told them we were going to clean all the garages. But that's kind of when I thought that was, this is only going to last a little bit. All the garages are clean, <laughs> so now we're on to uh, other things. My, uh, my son who went to Notre Dame, Kennedy, he took the opportunity to uh, get his pilot's license during this time. So he's, uh, he's, he's become an aviator. My youngest son, Austin, who is, as you know, uh, has been one of the challenges for us. Austin uh, has cystic fibrosis, and so uh, when he was first diagnosed with that in, um, in you know, uh, 20 years, 19 years ago, the disease was really, really almost uh, very terminal. But over the years, you know, uh, it, we've worked very hard, and pro progress has been made. And so here he is, out to start his freshman year of college, and of mm -hmm. course. Being immunosuppressed and uh, sending him off to college, putting him in that environment with an immunosuppressed lung issue was probably not the right thing to do. So Austin's had a very um, rich and unique experience mm -hmm. because his graduation was different, and uh, now he's also attending uh, college remotely, which is not the experience that we all think about when we when we uh, go off to college, but. Uh, it's one of the things uh, you know. I, I, I concentrated on telling him to make it rich, make it unique, and he's actually in Colorado. We made him do it remotely. We really didn't want to keep him at home and in his bedroom and in the same environment mm -hmm. that he's been in. And he seems to be doing really well. And he does have g good stories for us. So uh, ev everybody's well, and, and thank you for creating this opportunity. No, it's great. Well, you, you know that. Uh our prayers are always with you and your family, and in, and, and in particular, we have some students here at Notre Dame who are living on campus with cystic fibrosis, and, and given the coronavirus, it's always a, a, a paramount concern in terms of keeping them safe, but, but he seems to be handling it with tremendous courage and, uh, and his consistent zest for life in which he gets uh, you know, from you and Pam and the whole culture of your family. So, at the outset, let's let's talk a little bit about the impact of of the pandemic on your industry, in particular aviation. Um, how have you guys ad ad adapted? And um, you know, when you when you look at the challenges, not just today, but in the months and, and years ahead, how do you think the aviation industry is going to change because of this? Well, first of all, you, the effect of the pandemic, right? There's not a portion of our life does it permeate. Let me first start, Lou, by uh, you know applauding Notre Dame, uh, and because uh, one of the things that I think has to happen during a time like this is leadership is more important than ever. And I mm -hmm. and I always uh, I always talk about leadership in our companies. I talk about it as formulate, follow through, and follow up. Now, as you know, I had an opportunity uh, to spend. Uh, uh, some very uh, fine quality time with Father Hesburgh over the years, mm -hmm. and one of the things he mentioned, he almost used those three things uh, for me. He would, he would say that you have to be decisive, so you have to come up with a decision. Mm -hmm. He would say that you have to communicate that decision, and then he would say you have to be open to changing or hearing when the decision has to be made in a, in a, in a it, it has to go somewhere else. So, those leadership techniques during the pandemic are extreme. Oh, one thing I got to tell you is what uh, Father, Hes Father Hesburgh used to say when you're between, when, when there's no good outcome, when, when you're damned if you're due and you're damned with your dote, then do. Mm -hmm. And so I always love that saying mm -hmm. that Father Hesburgh had. Um, so this, I think this pandemic has really caused us to have to really step up to be leaders. I've been through four different recessions, uh, slowdowns in our industry alone, going back into the to high interest rates in the 80s, um, all through, through the dot-com bomb, through the financial crisis of 2008. What's different to me about 
the pandemic is it's unfolding every day. Most of those crises, crises were uh, immediate. They, um, you had to react. They, in some ways, were more drastic because uh, the impact was broad. This one has seemed to be to be kind of like a slow evolution. Mm. And even today, uh, when I think about uh, what Notre Dame has ahead of it, th there's, there's a little ways to go to figure out how many more curves and twists. We don't really know what the ending looks like. Is it is a vaccine? Is it uh, all of a sudden infections go away? So at, from a leadership standpoint, we have to be constantly uh, taking in more information and being able to react that into that. Mm -hmm. At our company individually, we, uh, we recognized early on that we would have to do this and we chopped it up into 90 day increments. And today we still think about <clears throat> what we're tackling in 90 day increments. We ask our people, um, so we, we have to put in plans as you could imagine in aviation, there's a tremendous amount of planning. You know, uh, 150 airplanes don't make their way around the world just by chance. Mm -hmm. And so we have to do a lot of planning into that. And this has to do with scheduling. It has to do with um, just what the demand is gonna be, what parts of the world we can even go to, because today, you know, on a daily basis, countries are opening and closing, and we don't know what that's gonna be. We have to constantly uh, be nimble about that. But when it started, uh, the first thing that we thought about was the safety and health of, of all the people that worked for us. And so one of the things uniquely that we had to do here, our, 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 our flight crews, we have about almost about 900 flight crews. And one of the things is they live anywhere in the United States and they commute via airline mm -hmm. to go to their airplanes to go fly. Of course, during the pandemic, there were two problems with that. Airlines were changing routes all the time, so we didn't know how to get people to their planes or reliably could they get there. But most importantly, we thought we'd be putting them in harm's way, and, and in fact, in two harms, right? If they, were, if they were in close proximity, then they could hurt our customers. Our customers, you know, a corporate jet is a much smaller airplane. There's really not a dividing door between the, the crew. In fact, we asked them to be socially interactive with our customers when they're on the plane. Plane. So we had to protect our customers and then our families, our pilots families were going through the exact same thing that everybody else's mm -hmm. families were. The kids were home from school, dad, they didn't want dad or mom to be out flying and then come home from being exposed and now they're exposing the family. So we had to conquer those early on and that really caused us to do something that was unique in the industry. We set up our own internal airline mm -hmm. and we now have today eight aircraft that run our own schedule that just fly our pilots to and from their homes. We had to change the schedules around and we had to have common points of where those pilots went. But those were some of the actions we had to take early on. Um, as you could imagine, as it unfolded, uh, the airline services changed. You know, they had to cut back a lot of airline services. Um, when you travel on a corporate jet, you're not traveling in public transportation. You're, you're kind of traveling uh, privately. And so you're traveling with your family or a group of people you know for the most part. But so we have that benefit. And then so from a sales perspective, our, what, what we didn't realize in the first 90 days, but did happen in the second 90 days, is there then became some demand for what we were doing. So we had to balance this increase in demand, the safety of our customers, most importantly, the safety of our employees. And as I said, this is still ongoing. but. As of right now, we've, uh, you know, a, a private transportation has, has played an important role in this. And, and I think uh, right now it still seems like it's moving in that direction. Fantastic. When you didn't uh, begin as the, uh, the leader of seven different aviation companies, you, you started from scratch, like most everyone out there. You were an ROTC student uh, here at Notre Dame, and then you served in the, in the military, and then you began by, uh, by serving as a pilot for hire, and uh, you flew some impressive clients over the years. Can you tell us a little bit about your kind of growth, which I think always was characterized by passion and a spirit of service, but, but who were some of those maybe early on passengers who were particularly memorable? Well, first of all, you are, you, you are right. I got into aviation. I actually started in accounting 
in, in at Notre Dame, and uh, but uh, I, I was on. I went through an ROT, uh, Air Force ROTC scholarship where I learned to fly, mm -hmm. and uh, I will tell you that when my um, when I was dropped off at college, my um, my family's Italian, so they, it was really hard for them to ever leave their son. You know, college drop-offs in and of themselves can be, they're always an emotional event. And so on the Sunday when my parents were supposed to leave, they weren't done yet. They still wanted to have a little dinner, so they stayed over till Monday. And then on Monday, they wanted to see how my classes went. So they, and, and then college, you have Monday, Wednesday classes, and then you have Tuesday Thursday classes. So they stayed over um, to the Tuesday class to see how that went. The good news was that after every parent had left and my parents were still in town, that weekend there was a home football game. And so the room they were staying in was rented out, so they, they finally kicked them out on, on Wednesday. And when, as they were leaving and it was, it was time to depart, my father said to me, enjoy your time in college. Uh, do some things you wouldn't ordinarily do. Try some different things. Make sure you learn about what what inspires you. And I want to know that when you graduate, you've found your passion. And that was his last words of advice when, when he left me. Um, my mother had a different theory at that time. My mother, not to be outdone my father, she had actually walked away kind of tearfully. And after my dad finished his speech about passion, my mom turned around and said to me, and don't get any diseases. So uh, just like an Italian mom, she had, she had a different approach as to what college needed to meant for me. But I did. While I was in college, I fell in love with aviation. And uh, I remember I've only seen my father uh, cry twice in his life, once when his mother died. And the second time was at graduation when I told him I'd found my passion and I was not going to be an accountant, but I was going to be a pilot. So obviously, he must have meant find his passion, not my passion. But, but, it, but I did. So I actually you know, spent 15 years as a, as a, as a, as a pilot, uh, and, and um, an international pilot where I flew around the world. And uh, from that, I got into a particular part of flying, basically like concert tours. And what happens in a concert tour is the, they only want one crew because of security, confidentiality, you know, they don't want you selling pictures to the, to the tabloids at that time or posting them on Instagram today. So they would hire a crew who was reliable. And so I started to get a reputation as someone that could be reliable. And I flew Elton John and Barbara Streisand, and, but most of these concert tours are three to four months. They're the summer, maybe a longer one might be five months. And when you get, a, when you get this job, you only, you only get paid for the four or five months you fly. Now you get more pay than a pilot would get if he had a full-time job, but you're on and off. So whenever you're asked to do a uh, whenever you're asked to have a gig, you always wanted to know, well, how long am I going to be employed for? And so a guy calls me up and says to me, um, have you ever done a political campaign? And I said, I have not, but of course I asked the important question, how long is it for? And he says, well, it's for 13 months. Well, he had my attention, right? This is a 13-month job. And I said, um, what's the person running for? He said, well, he's running for president. And I said, who is it? And he said, well, it's the governor of Arkansas. And I said, the governor of Arkansas has no chance of leading an airplane for 13 months. This guy will be out of the race before it even gets going. But that began a 13-month uh, relationship with, uh, with, with President Clinton. And um, it's, it's not a political statement. One of the things that I learned was that just how intelligent to, t take, to get to that position uh, it, it was really, it, it, it's not as, you know, we can all be quick to criticize these people, but, but it does take some discipline and intelligence to get there. My, uh, my, my you know, and the other thing is, is on the airplane, when you fly someone like that, that's a safe zone for them. So they tend to be very, very open. And um, I remember uh, asking uh, President Clinton, this was actually in 2002 after he had left office, and in 2002, the Democrats had suffered a big defeat. This was right after 9-11, and so the country moved very much towards a defense posturing, which was really around the Republican Party. And I remember asking uh, President Clinton, what do you think the Democrats did wrong? And he said, you know what? 
To be a successful politician, you only have to do four things. Agree, defend, attack, and propose. Now, first of all, if anybody tells you the four key things to be as successful as President Clinton was in profession, you, you, you pay a little of attention to him. And, he used to, and, and so he would just say, agree, getting attacked on 9-11 can't happen. Defend every time we've been attacked. It's been the, uh, Roosevelt, it's been the Democrats who have defended this country, right? And so, and, and he had the, uh, attack the, attack the enemy, if we, I mean, attack your opponent. If we let them continue to do this, we'll be in worse shape. And here's what I propose we do. And, it, you know, to this day, that's really just uh, stuck with me. Uh, the other interesting thing uh, with Clinton was just I, um, I flew him after they get elected and before they take office. They don't use Air Force One. They still fly privately, although it's paid for by the government. So my 13-month uh, gig went on for actually two and a half more months. But I flew him to the inauguration, and I flew him, Hillary, and Chelsea. And I flew them from Little Rock to, uh, they wanted, he wanted to, to start at Jefferson's hometown in, in Virginia, so in Charlottesville. So when, I, when we landed, this would be the last time I would see him, uh, having been with him for 15 months, getting close to the family and so on. And so I, uh, and then he was, he'd parade in and then he would be on Air Force One for the next eight years. And um, I opened the cabin door to walk back to see, to just say goodbye really. And the three of them were embraced in a family hug, saying a prayer, mm. crying. And I have to tell you, it was so human. And so no matter, you know, I think one of the keys of leadership is to maintain your empathy and humanity. And, and I really experienced it in that moment. And uh, it, was, it was quite a touching uh, moment for me. Yeah, that's a, that's a powerful... Uh... A story. So you grow up in a middle class uh, background, only child in Cleveland. Your dad's a government worker. How do you choose to come to Notre Dame? And as you look back on it, how those four years at Notre Dame, how have they really kind of shaped your your life as a leader and, and as a person beyond the workplace as well? Well, I, uh, coming to Notre Dame was never certain for me. Uh, I actually had a full ride scholarship to Gambier College mm -hmm. uh, in Pennsylvania. And um, we, as you uh, my father was a government employee, he was a GS 12. Uh, he actually worked in an undercover capacity. I grew up with my father having a fake name, Richard Dill. And uh, he'd go away for three or four weeks. And this happened to be one of the times he was home. And I, had a, I went to a, a Jesuit high school. And despite that fact, I still applied to Notre <laughs> Dame. And uh, uh, I had uh, gone up there, uh, experienced the university, and felt very much at home there, like so many people do. And I remember coming home and um, t talking about my experience of seeing the campus and that. And my parents, we lived in a, a small 900 square foot home, but more importantly, they didn't have like two by four walls. They had the little two by two walls. So, so anything you said in the front of the house, you could hear in the back of the house. And I remember late at night hearing my parents talk about the fact that uh, it was not affordable for me uh, to attend Notre Dame at that time. And so really, the right thing was the, the college, the, the scholarship college. And they were discussing like who was going to uh, present this, uh, who was going to present this to me. It so happened that a friend of mine was going up for a second time to, to, up to this campus. And so I was, I, I kind of put it out of my mind. It was in the back. I jumped up. We drove up to the, for a weekend at the university again. And uh, we, we got there on Friday. I remember going to the financial aid office and just asking like what opportunities were open. Now, to refresh your memory, this is 1974. I was trying to find $3,600. That was the tuition at Notre Dame at, the, at that time. And unfortunately, you know, financial aid wasn't, wasn't today. There wasn't a universal loan program. The, you, it was kind of get as get can. And I remember financial aid said, well, a lot, you really need kind of a longer time to identify what might be for you. You might consider starting at Gambier College and then transfer in here next year. And they said, or uh, there's one other option. Have you ever considered the military? Because if you remember, the Vietnam War was very unpopular. It ended in 73. And so nobody really wanted to be in ROTC at the time. It was very unpopular. You had to have short hair. Long hair was in. 
So um, as Lou started off by saying, I always have had a little bit of a fashion bug in me. And so I said, well, I think I'd go join the military. I think, what would I do in the military? I said, I'd want to be a pilot. And I think I'd want to be a naval pilot because I just kind of feel like double-breasted looks better on a man than single-breasted. <laughs> so uh, armed with my idea that I would be a double-breasted pilot for the U.S. Navy, I, on Saturday morning, made my way over to the ROTC building where I was going to find out how you got an ROTC scholarship. Lo and behold, the Navy uh, door was locked. And as I was trying to reach in to get the uh, phone number of the, because there weren't cell phones, I was trying to reach in to get a phone number to call them, somebody taps me on the back, and it's the colonel from the Air Force. And I explained to him that I was interested in being a pilot. And two hours later, I was in the Air Force. So that's really how, that was really how I got to Notre Dame and uh, how I could afford it. My parents were extremely happy. And, um, you know, there's lots of things I could say about my time at Notre Dame. The most important would, to me would be that the time I spent, spent, got to spend with Father Ted. <laughs> and Father Ted was the president of the university. But beyond that, he was a late night person. I'm still a late night person. And it's still amazing to me. I, I can't imagine what university I could have possibly gone to where I'd have had access to someone at that level in, 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 the, in the campus. And what you realize is, and I know this happens, this happens, this has happened with all of the other presidents and most of the senior uh, executive team uh, at Notre Dame, that they still do recognize it's about the students and they do, they, they do find time for that. I know that you do that in your freshman classes that, mm -hmm. that uh, many of the faculty and staff, te that many of the, the uh, 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 staff teaches. Um, but undoubtedly, Lou, the uh, uh, opportunity to uh, have the influence of Father Hesburgh in my life uh, shaped, shaped so many things, and it certainly was one of the, uh, the, the biggest blessings I had there. So, Ken, let's go back to um, early on in your career. You're discovering that you have an aptitude for business, and you're beginning to experience some success and yet you find yourself at a very introspective moment. Um, is this the right gift that I've been given, the, the gift to be able to make money? And, and you're, you're struggling with this, so you decide at a pivotal moment uh, to come back to campus and to go back to Father Ted, who you had cultivated this wonderful relationship with, to talk to him about it. Can you tell us a little bit about that moment and how that conversation proceeded? So, um, so I had been flying for s several years, but you have to look back at the time that this still was the very early days of private aviation. You know, realistically, I did have the benefit of entering into the private aviation field at a time where there were 5,000 jets in total in the world. You know, today there's some 30,000. So I really did have the benefit, the ability, I did grow up within that. Always through my uh, time, as an undergraduate at Notre Dame, for I, I think I always, I don't want to say, it wasn't a struggle, it was a question. It was a question about, um, what, what, like, what is a successful life? Can a successful life just really be defined by only how much money you make? Is a successful life only by how many children you have? And there's no doubt about it, I have a little bit of an achiever gene, so I was gonna, if there's gonna be a success life, I really wanted to make sure I didn't miss out on, on what that defined. I can remember, Lou, in my undergraduate year, before I have the serious conversation, um, that I went to Father Hesburgh and I said, Father, I've really been thinking about capitalism and its role within the Catholic Church. And I have to tell you, I'm darn sure that if Jesus was alive today, he would be a communist, not a capitalist. <laughs> <laughs> and only Father Hesburgh could say, I'm not so sure he would have been a communist. <laughs> so uh, you, could tell, um, you could tell at an early age that I, this was on my mind. It was on, a, it was, I, I, um, it was on my mind about how to, 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 to do something uh, and do it for the right reasons. And so there came a time when I was flying where there was an opportunity, a business opportunity. And I was shying away from the opportunity because I was like, this isn't gonna take me away. By that time, I'm flying to South Africa. I'm enjoying my, this will take me away from flying somewhat and put me on the business side. Yet 
there was a part of me that clearly recognized this opportunity was significant. It was also something that is there ever like I don't know if any if you, I don't know if people do crossword puzzles. There's just some people that have a knack for something. Mm -hmm. Some people look at a crossword puzzle, they get it right away. Mm -hmm. Some people can you know some people are just great at karaoke. People have certain instincts. I could look at a transaction like this transaction I was considering, and it just made all the sense. And and to this day, I would tell you that that was a certainly a gift that I had was the ability to kind of quickly digest uh, numbers, balance sheets, and translate them to how a transaction could, but how a transaction could be done. But I was nervous. I was nervous that this would take me on a path that would be totally, uh, fo this would take me on a business path. Mm -hmm. And um, so I had the opportunity to, uh, uh, Father Hesper was receptive and I went back to see him. And I said, I started the conversation by telling Father Hesper, you know, Father, I now realize, you know, the gift. I'm an okay pilot, but I really do have this, this business gift. And I even think I said to him, uh, I think this is a pretty crappy gift. Mm -hmm. I said, you know, a good gift would be that I could cure cancer. Mm -hmm. A good gift would be what, you know, that I could be a student, that I could teach students, that a good gift would be to be a psychiatrist, to heal people. I don't know anything about those. I, I wasn't given that gift. I have this gift for business. And it's a little bit scary because I, I, I feel like it's the wrong gift. It's the wrong mm -hmm. thing to do. And Father Hesburgh said to me, you know what? God gave you that gift because it's a very, very difficult gift. It's a difficult gift because you will always be on the knife's edge of deciding if your life is qualitative or quantitative. Mm -hmm. And only people who are as thoughtful as you, who spend the time to think about it, can really take that gift of business, of accumulating money, of taking those gift of quantitative gifts, right? They're so quantitative and making them qualitative. So if you keep focusing in your life about how the qualitative side of that gift works and not the quantitative side, I think you'll be, uh, I think you'll realize just how important that gift was. And he was right. He was very right, and I take it very seriously to this day. We try to do things in our company uh, just from the standpoint that we've always prided ourselves on having the best kind of health insurance we have. Uh, most companies have um, some sort of a, a policy for uh, if people have to have a, a leave of absence. I mean, many of these policies, Lou, are the same policies that I know you have at Notre Dame. Mm -hmm. we, have a, we, have a, we have a funding of an adoption. Any of our, any of our employees that want to adopt a child, we fund those kinds of mm -hmm. things. So we keep focusing on the qualitative part because I'm scared. If I mm -hmm. don't, mm -hmm. I'll just become that quantitative person that I was always scared the gift could take me to. Wow, what a, what a moving story that is and, uh, and how wonderful it is to this day to, to hear the words of impact uh, from, from Father Todd. I want to ask you to talk a little bit um, and take us through the transformative gift that you and Pamela made in 2017 and the thought process behind it. Uh, but first, this gift was in many ways the culmination of a long history, stretching over many years of generosity to Notre Dame. Uh, what began small ended up becoming uh, and in, turning into a large gift. Um, so what started you down this path and, and when in your career did you start thinking about giving back as a philanthropist? Well, I would tell you that um, when you start thinking, I would tell you that uh, I try to keep in my thought, but like I talked to you a little bit about empathy, right? And I talked to you a little bit about my, my fear of becoming quantitative in my life. So I think I was always trying to figure out, uh, I always want, wanted to challenge myself on just how not to be quantitative. And so when you ask how I got started with Notre Dame, I don't know, I mean, I would try to do act of kindness. I mean, I would, be, I would participate in things at the church. I mean, I tried to, to be thoughtful and kind where I could, but I hadn't yet translated that to anything monetarily, maybe then other what I would uh, give at my local parish and that sort of thing. And um, uh, Tom Bloom, who was in development at the time at Notre Dame, he came to an event in Cleveland, Ohio. 
and uh, they invited the young alumni. I, 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 I'm going to think back. I was probably in my early 30s. I think it was 33 or 34 at the time. And it was a nice event. I, you know, they talk about football, and they talk about all the things you want to hear uh, when, you, when you get to reconnect with the university at that age. And after that, he um, called me up, and he asked me, Ken, would I be too aggressive if I asked you to give $5,000 to the university? And I didn't. I, I, by the way, I, I was pretty young, and I didn't understand that you went to these events, and then there's something else followed on. But, but OK, now I'm educated. And I, um, as I was contemplating through that gift, uh, I, as a pie, I was still flying at the time, although doing a little bit of businesses, some businesses, but mostly flying. One of the things as a pilot, you get to read a lot because you have, you're on the road and you're waiting. And so uh, I, I, I read a book. And this book was about uh, leadership because as I was starting a business, I wanted to learn as much as I could about leadership. And there, it was, it, the book was about leadership. And one of the past, one of the things about showing what leadership could be was talking about an Indian tribe and how they picked the chief of this tribe. And in order to become the chief of the tribe, one of the things you had to do was to give away all your worldly possessions to show that you had the courage of leadership, that you could actually put yourself behind everybody, and that touched me. It, touched, it was coincidental that the ask came at the same time, and so it was at that time that I kind of looked around at what my liquidity was, and I decided to um, give away my liquidity at that time to the university. And that was really the first scholarship that, that is there. It's still there today. It's my, in my mother and father's name. And uh, so that started me on, uh, and I, I tell you what, Still to this day, I hope you see, I'm, I'm proud of that. I'm proud that uh, my wife says, I'm not sure we could do that again. But, but, but I, was, I, I was very proud of being able to do that. Um, I have to, go ahead, I'm sorry. You said it was about 5,000. You're a very young alum, and you come back with a $100,000 commitment. I mean, that almost never happens. It's an extraordinary act of generosity. In some ways, that initial gift for me is as inspiring, if not more, than this, the last gift of 100 million. You know what, I, I, I tell my children this. I, I think people, you, I understand, and thank you for saying it, I really do, I don't think the amount is, is important as, because I, I try not to think of things as quantitative, okay? The qualitative part of that gift was so much more important. The way, I have to tell you, the way it made me feel, the way it made me get courage, the made, made me feel like a leader, okay? It instilled confidence. It was, it, that gift returned three or four times or 300 times more to me than it meant to the university. And so that really began, it really set the tone for something that we've tried to do, uh, you know, uh, um, throughout the rest of my, my life. Uh, you know, I, I didn't have children at the time. And when you, um, when, when you start to, uh, when you start to think qualitatively, transferring that qualitative, um, that, that qualitative vision to your children is equally important. So we started when our children were very young to begin to teach them the qualitative side of giving. I, I mean, so we, we very young, uh, we have always as a family, I know a lot of families shy away from talking about finances within the family for fear that, you know, somehow if you know what dad makes or, it's just, I don't know why. I, I, I say sometimes that families talk about sex more than they'll talk about money. And, uh, but we, I didn't want to do that because this is, I think, a very, quantitative temptation that we need to avoid significantly. So we started our children young. Every year we, we would we create, we have a little family foundation and every year we would have the kids bring ideas. And so we started to cultivate in them this, uh, this, this concept of giving. And, and it's funny because they all, even, even um, at the time when, when all three children were, we'd gather around, we usually do it around Christmas, uh, and we would, and everyone would bring a proposal to the, to, to the five of us about who they should give money to. And uh, I remember Austin was uh, maybe four or five at the time, and so for the, next, for the next eight years of Austin's life, it was Disney, Disney, Disney. We always were, he always wanted to donate to Disney. And I kept explaining to him, Austin, Disney is a corporation. They don't have, they, they do that. 
Well, that, that little son of a gun, he went online and found that Disney has a foundation to help kids. So then the next year, he came and presented to the family with, uh, we're gonna, with the, giving money to the Disney Foundation. And of course, we, we couldn't turn him down. <laughs> so um, so we, we tried to instill this. So I don't think, uh, I, don't, I, I don't really like to think of the gift um, as quantitative, mm -hmm. okay? I think of the gift of more what it says about our family, more what it says about uh, you know what we stand for. The amount of the gift, really, as you know, Lou, it, we the, the gift was really kind of a sig very significant profess, uh, percentage of our net worth, mm -hmm. um, but which was important to me. Mm -hmm. I think that um, I think the hardest uh, uh, you know some of the hardest gifts are you know. An easy gift to give is not as challenging as a gift that's hard to give. Mm -hmm. um, so it, it needed to be significant. What I find today is that when people work on estate gifts, and remember this is an estate gift, and mm -hmm. maybe we'll have time to talk a little bit about the mm -hmm. structure of it, but, but when people do estate planning today, there is only one perspective, and that perspective is quantitative. Mm -hmm. If you think about the attorneys that do estate planning, the accountants that do estate planning, there's no question on there that says, qualitatively, what do you think your estate, the end of your life should look like? Mm -hmm. Now, you know what's crazy is people find ways to make a qualitative statement at the end of their lives. I've been, uh, I had an aunt who had a Pizzell machine, which is a way to make a kind of Italian cookie. Mm -hmm. And she had in her will that that Pizzell machine went to her niece who liked to make Pizzells with her. Mm -hmm. So we do, at the end of our life, want to make qualitative statements about what was important to us. Mm -hmm. but, but that's not what the state planning is, uh, the professionals in estate planning are not set up to do that. Right. The lawyers and the accountants are set up to maximize, to minimize your taxes and maximize the flow of capital, of quantity, of quantitative amounts to your heirs, however you might see them to be. And um, I think as I started to look at our estate plan, I realized that I wasn't going to find what I wanted in that circle. And mm -hmm. so that began, began the search for how to devise a plan. And look, m my hat is so off to Notre Dame, you don't think about it a lot, but, but Notre Dame took risks to do this. Mm -hmm. uh, they had to be entrepreneurial and thinking outside the box. Uh, you and I have talked before, Lou, I, I, I think that we, have, we didn't try to publicize the gift as in, a, a, in a quantitative way. We publicized the gift to use it as a way to educate people mm -hmm. on how you can do a gift of this manner, how you do it without using, using a different way to approach the lawyers and accountants that are involved mm -hmm. in, in that. So I didn't really want my end of life statement to be, I save the most amount of taxes for my children. Mm -hmm. By the way, having been, you know, when, when you're in private aviation, when you're in private travel, you do tend to be around people that are on the wealthier end of the, of the spectrum. I meet a lot of wealthy people. Mm -hmm. I hear a lot of stories about families who get hurt by the estate, by inheriting the business. Sometimes they are running their father's business because they were obligated to do it. They never really wanted to do it. Maybe dad didn't want to give any of the business to the daughter, he, he only gave it to the son. Now the daughter and the son don't get along. There, you can do more damage by quantitatively uh, getting the businesses uh, that way. One of the things I'll tell you is as, I've, as, as, my, as, I've, as my children understand the estate plan, it's not equal. Our estate plan is not equal. We didn't attempt to make it equal. They're different ages. Every one of the ch children came in at a different time. And so th this wasn't about equalizing it. And I tell the kids, if that upsets you, you're really in the wrong family because this isn't about making you all equal. You'll all figure it out and you'll help each other. Mm -hmm. And so that was really, so I started from the, from the uh, premise that I didn't want to have a gift that destroyed the family. And if I were to just merely pass down businesses or pass down money, to children that had no passion for the businesses, that uh, were then fighting with each other because one ran one business and one ran the other. So I, start, I knew right away to start with that my estate plan was gonna include a mandatory liquidation of those businesses. So that's, that was number one. Um, what Notre Dame did is, uh, so there's, there's like seven businesses today. Now, 
What I didn't want to preclude was I didn't want to preclude the opportunity for one of the children who wants one of the businesses to then be in that business. Mm -hmm. So imagine that on my death, these businesses will be liquidated, and I don't remember, but Lou, we, Lou probably does. We have a period of time, it might be five years or seven years, where the university steps in to begin the liquidation process. So the university, if you think about it, becomes the trustee of my estate. They're in charge with wrapping up. If I don't pick them, you know who you pick as a trustee today mostly? You pick a lawyer, you pick a banker, and by the way, you pick a lawyer or a banker your age, not to say you won't outlive them, and if you're with a lawyer and a banker, remember a trustee has to be independent. Mm -hmm. So if you outlive that lawyer or banker, then the next thing that happens is the new junior banker is now the trustee or your estate. Mm -hmm. And they might know nothing about Ken Rickey. They don't know what I wanted. They don't know my intentions. And so what I felt was put Notre Dame in that role as the trustee, Maybe I'll outlive Lou, maybe not, probably, probably not. He's much healthier than I am. Mm -hmm. but, but if I do and someone else besides Lou is there, I know where they come from. I know where they're grounded. I know what that university believes. And so those were a few of the premises that we went into the, to designing this. Uh, design this. And it, it, was, it took a while. Uh, Notre Dame had to get educated on it. Um, I, I'll tell you this, even as we were just about to sign the final documents, I had a lawyer who advised us, and just at the last minute, he couldn't resist. He said, you sure you don't want to create a trust between you and Notre Dame? He was just, he took that last try just to, just to get me outside of, of, of putting Notre Dame in charge of everything. <laughs> no, that's, it's an incredible story on so many levels, uh, Ken. And if we if we, we try to unpack it, you know, a couple of questions um, immediately come to the surface. You're still young and very healthy, so why did you do the gift now? And then also, what makes this gift so exceptional is that, that you made it unrestricted. Um, you're leaving it up to the university when the gift is received in terms of how they will allocate it to its highest priorities. Can you tell us a little bit about the timing and then also the reasoning uh, to make it unrestricted? So let's, let's start with the, the unrestricted nature, right? Mm -hmm. If you're gonna give a gift, you really, it's really about the receiver of the gift. Gifts that are about the giver of the gift, to me, are really approaching more of that knife edge of being quantitative. And I, I look, the universities, all universities, not, not just Notre Dame, but so many gifts are given out of a kind heart and a good heart, but they can be misplaced. For instance, I could have very easily made a gift to her scholarship for an Italian pilot from Cleveland, Ohio, right? I, then the university would be going around for years trying to find the Italian pilot from Cleveland, Ohio. And what happens to that is even though that was a gift to the university, that might, Italian, who know, we might not even have it pilots 20 years from now or 30 years from now. But if I made that restriction to the university, there's, there's two problems. Number one, it really wasn't about them. It really wasn't about the receiver of the gift. And what the receiver of this gift told me is what we need most is unrestricted gifts. Mm -hmm. And remember, if I trusted them enough to run the estate, would I not trust them to do what's right with the gift down the road? Mm -hmm. So uh, to me, it's what the university wanted, okay? And then second of all, it's what they needed. Uh, second of all, you just, it just gets really, um, it really gets really tempting when you start negotiating. Um, I, I'm not even, I, I understand that there's, there's, there's two ways to, I, I still get somewhat, um, uneasy, let's just say, when people say, uh, oh, we were at the Ricky Family Fields. Mm -hmm. You know what? I really love the band. I love what the band does. I think it's so, I think sometimes the sounds of life are so important, and I connect the band with, uh, with the sounds of life. Um, and so that's why I've been supportive of them. And if the band told me they needed music stands, they'd have the music stands, and we probably wouldn't call them the Ricky music stands. Mm -hmm. And so I, I think that um, it, it, it does make me a, a little bit uncomfortable that that we do kind of have this this you know the system of, of naming and, and doing all this. But I, I recognize there there has to you know that, that that it's 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 not if you think about that in perspective of being proud of what you did, mm -hmm. 
this is what I tell my kids, is that be proud of, of, um, of the gift. Don't look at it as braggadocious. You didn't do it to be brag. You did it to be proud of the university, to say, I believed in what this university does. So um, once you kind of get that mindset, then really the university needed unrestricted. And, and Lou, I really wanted to do two things with this gift, right? One was to set a standard, to make people aware if I gave you a thousand dollar unrestricted gift, you, that would be important too. Mm -hmm. But to do it at a high level, will, I hope, will make other donors think about the fact that unrestricted is very, very important to the, to the, to the, to the university. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and that was one. And then, and then two, to think about the qualitative nature of, of what you do with your estate. Mm -hmm. um, I always say uh, sometimes like when people, people try to um, create an estate plan that controls from the grave. They try to set up a trust. <laughs> I'll give it to my daughter, my son, and then at 35 they can draw this, at 40 they can draw that, at 40. Look, if you raised your kids well, why are you controlling what they are doing at 35 and 40 and 45? And you know, we didn't talk much about my thoughts on management and, and trust and so on. Mm -hmm. but, but you know, it's a part of trust, trusting the university was was a, 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 an important part of that also. So um, that's really how we, we, we evolved on the gift and uh, you know why why was trying to make it uh, uh, pu public and significant so that maybe other people could benefit from from the view that I have on it. And, and um, how about the timing of it Ken why why now for you and Pamela to make make this, sizable gift, you're young, you're healthy, you hopefully have a lot of wonderful years ahead of you. Um, why now? Well, that's easy to say, right? It's easy to say that uh, why at such a young age? Because right. you want to think you could live another 20 or 30 years, we think. Mm -hmm. But who knows, right? And uh, estate gifts are, your, are a chance for you to speak to those who are not here when you, you know, it's kind of your last chance to make a statement about what your life is about. So making the gift this, this age clearly made, some, made a statement about what, what's in, important to me. Again, you don't know where it's go, when it's gonna happen, but re, the way, um, Lou, the way your team and I designed it, it's a flexible tool. Mm -hmm. We can keep adding to the gift. We can, we, w there, there may be more companies to work on mm -hmm. when we ultimately have to. So, Starting now to get people educated, it's a unique, right? It's unique. It's not mm -hmm. something the university's dealt with all the time. Mm -hmm. I'm hoping over the next 20 years, this university will become proficient at it. Mm -hmm. That will become uh, that 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 will have have you know a practice of how to do this, and that it, it, it really speaks to our our, our um, the values of the university to mm -hmm. have things like this going on. So. Um, you're not too young. I mean, it's easy to say, but let's suppose it was only a thousand dollar gift, and let's mm -hmm. suppose that was a hundred percent of all of my assets. That would still make a statement to the mm -hmm. people that are around me of what's important to me. Mm -hmm. It also look, my kids can read, <laughs> and and they read, and so they know where dads. They know the story. Like I mm -hmm. said, we do have a lot of conversations about about money in our family, mm -hmm. but. You know, my kids don't have to read it in the will. They already understand today mm -hmm. what's, what's important to me, and maybe some of that will translate to other Notre Dameers, to other members of the family, and so on. I've had people come up to me and said, you know, just tell me, and, you know, tell me why, what do you love about Notre Dame? Mm -hmm. And when I tell them, I can see that it clicks with them, and they get why this is something important we need to do. Yeah, I, I can't thank you enough, Ken. Uh, you know, I've had the privilege of, um, of working here at the university now for about 20 years. And uh, to, to be inspired by people as they, as they dig deep and make sacrifices and, and give back, um, give forward in many cases. But uh, your generosity, and in particular focusing on the qualitative over the quantitative, has, has been an important lesson and it's been both inspiring and humbling, I think, to all of us here at Notre Dame on the receiving end. Uh, as we close, I'd like to close with any, any parting words, uh, any parting words of wisdom that you'd like to share with us. There's already so much embedded in this interview, but, but any final, any final <laughs> thoughts? Well, I, 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 I want to come back to where we started, okay? I think that uh, 
a, a lot of times a, uh, a campaign or a slogan can be just a slogan. And when we talk about Notre Dame being bold, I'd like, you, I'd like people to understand that, A, this was a very bold act on, a mind, on just a one-on-one -on -one level, right, on a micro level with me. And what we're watching Notre Dame do in the pandemic is a macro indication of bold, and it's my faith and trust that the university will maintain its boldness for well beyond my life and many lives to come is what, I, what I'm so proud of and what brought me here today. Yeah, thanks. Thank you again, Ken. It's been a, a wonderful opportunity to, uh, to listen to your thoughts and be inspired by your actions. I know all of this is in service to Our Lady, uh, who guides and, and directs this university on a daily basis and has for the past 178 years. Thank you all for joining us. Uh, take care, God bless, and go Irish.